presentation on vegan winemaking with Jason. All right, thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm a little surprised it's not full since we're giving out free booze, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, More for us. Yeah, they'll, they'll, show, they'll, they'll show up at the end, I'm sure. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of dive into the world of vegan winemaking. I know that uh, most people think, hey, it's grapes. What do you mean vegan? What, what's, what's this? So I'm going to kind of dive into that world, a little bit about our parent uh, winery, which is Clos Le Chance. It's the company that I work for. We produce uh, the vegan vine. So a little bit about them, a little bit about myself, vegan winemaking, and then I'll save plenty of time at the end so we can dive into these wines and you can... Uh, See what we're producing? Better? All right. Um, so myself, Jason uh, Robidoux, I'm uh, from Santa Cruz originally. So um, from the area, grew up in the area. Uh, spent some time um, kind of all over making wine, Australia, Sonoma. Uh, got my degree from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So um, local guy, um, found Clola Chance and started making wine for them. And it was a, really a partnership that, that worked out for both of us. Clochance was started by the Murphy family uh, in 92. They had a small backyard vineyard um, that was just Chardonnay, about a half an acre, started making wine for fun, and started tasting it, started tasting really good. So they started another company installing vineyards, backyard vineyards, people's houses, Saratoga, all over uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains. Well, they started accumulating a lot of grapes, so they had to start actually making some real wines. So uh, that's when they partnered with a uh, company down in San Martin, where we're located now. Uh, called Cordoval, which is a resort down there. We, we have some fans. Um, it's uh, right on the uh, eastern side of the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, just about 20 minutes south of San Jose. That's where we are now. Uh, we have about 135 acres estate now, along with all the backyard vineyards that started our uh, company, Clos Chance. So um, we went from about 20 cases to now we produce just over 60,000 cases under the two labels. So. Uh, we grew pretty quick from 92 until now, and uh, I've been with them for about six years. And even though it's a family-run company, I'm not in the family. I do feel like part of the family. So, mm -hmm. um, so we can hit one there. Thank you. I don't have a. I don't have one of those fancy remotes. Uh, so we'll jump into the uh, vegan side of it and why uh, we started producing vegan wine. Um, the family is originally from New Hampshire. They were back home one summer and they were talking to one of their relatives that had just recently converted from vegetarianism to veganism and they started talking about well is wine vegan is beer vegan are these different alcohols that i consume are they vegan and well a lot of them are there's several animal products that go into wine production so they started asking you know us is your wine vegan and as a matter of fact most of our wines at that time were vegan we've now moved over to all vegan wine production for all of our labels um, so that's kind of how the conversation started. Um, at that time, we started getting a lot of inquiries. I started getting emails almost every day, at least once a week, from consumers that said, hey, I saw your wine at Safeway, I saw your wine here. Is your wine vegan? I want to consume it. And really, the, the wherewithal is out there and the education is out there that people can now learn whether or not their wines are vegan, whether or not the foods that they consuming, are consuming have animal products in them. So we started doing some research ourselves. We found that um, in a poll done just last year, 2012, um, two and a half percent of people actually uh, identify themselves as vegan, which is up from one percent in 2009. So the market is growing. There's over uh, it over doubled in just that three year time. So why why are people going vegan, or why are they identifying with vegan? Thank you. Um, did we skip one? No. Oh, no, we didn't. So I'll go back a little bit. I have notes on that one. Mm -hmm. uh, really, there are four big reasons why people are um, identifying, not these ones, there are four big reasons why people are identifying themselves as vegans. Um, one of them, of course, is animal compassion. There's a lot out there now of what's happening to animals and, and animal cruelty in food production, not just producing the meat, but extracting certain animal products to help produce different kinds of food. Uh, the other one, of course, is health benefits of a plant-based diet. Uh, heart health, uh, diabetes, obesity, blood pressure, these are all things that can be managed and helped with plant-based diets. Uh, the other big thing which uh, we've kind of jumped on board with and seen is the explosion of vegan celebrities. Ellen, John Sally, different celebrities out there are identifying themselves as vegans. Their Twitter, their Facebook, everything, people are seeing it and they're kind of following the trend and realizing that the information is out there. 
And then finally is the, the benefit to the environment. So now jumping into the wine side of things, the question came up, well, isn't wine just grapes? And really it's not. And the, and the thing we're seeing out there is people are saying, I had no idea. These are the big four, what we call. These are what are used to help produce wine. There are a few other extraneous ones, but these are really the big ones. Isinglass is a fish bladder, uh, primarily sturgeon, which is used in wine production. I'm gonna kind of get into these as we go so you can kind of see you know, why we use them and what they're for in winemaking. Um, egg whites, which has been used for thousands of years in France, Italy, it's been a very common use in wine. Uh, milk proteins, casein, and gelatin are, are the big ones. So starting with uh, why we use them. So fermentation control is the first one. So uh, we get our grapes in, we start the fermentation, and one of the things we want to prevent is what's called malolactic fermentation. Now that's on the first wine we have here, Sauvignon Blanc, it's not malolactic fermented. So it's not secondary fermentation. It's alcohol, it's uh, primary fermentation is alcohol, the secondary fermentation is converting malic acid to lactic acid. So we want to prevent that in that wine because we don't want a buttery characteristic like you would get in a Chardonnay. We want it to be that crisp Sauvignon Blanc style. So we use uh, lysozyme, which is an egg-based protein that is used to deactivate the enzymes and actually prevent malolactic fermentation. The other ones are wine clarification. So finding stabilization and softening. Finding essentially is a binding of a positive molecule and a negative molecule and settling out. So finding agents like gelatin and other things can actually get in there and they can help settle the wine and clean the wine, clarify it. Stabilization, if you stick your white wine into uh, the refrigerator or the freezer if you're in a hurry and you pull it out and it looks kind of cloudy, that wine's not stable. So what we do to stabilize the wine is we can use different animal products to um, actually pull those what's called tartrates out of solution, sell them out. There's other ways to get around that and that's what I'm going to get into later. And then finally is softening which is um, sort of like the clarification of the finding, except this is actually to round out the mouthfeel. So this isn't an appearance, this isn't an astringency, this is purely mouthfeel. So, before we get into all the technical winemaking jargon, why did we specifically go vegan? Uh, it's a highly targeted sales channel. So there's a market out there. With the market growing, we wanted to be on board and not just be on board, we wanted to promote it and say, hey, we're on your side, we've got these wines that are out there and we want to show you. We don't want you to have to guess or call or chase or try to find out which wines are vegan. We're out there, we're branded the vegan vine, you can actually see that, that our wines are vegan. And the one thing we really want to get across is that you can still produce high quality wines. We want to make sure that people realize you're not sacrificing quality. Most of our wines were already made vegan. We were already making award-winning, very high-quality wines. People just didn't know that it was a vegan product. Go for it. So, um, so organic or biodynamic uh, labeled wines are not necessarily vegan? No, they're not. Uh, organic or biodynamic is a certification, and it deals with pesticides or sulfites added to a wine, whereas it has no correlation to actual animal products use. It's a good question. So in producing the high-quality wines, um, really what we learned is that taking a step back, minimalistic winemaking and really getting back to some old-world techniques can really help prevent the need and the use for animal products down the road. A lot of animal products are used to correct wines, over-extracted, overworked wines. So we want to make sure if you start from the beginning, you can avoid even needing to use those specific animal products. Thank you. All right, so the modern day finding standards. So this is getting back to a little bit more of uh, what's out there again and uh, what we can do to kind of counteract it. Uh, this is, you can't quite see up there, but it is for white wine production. Then I'll get into red wine next. Uh, so isinglass, gelatin, and uh, potassium caseinate, which is a milk, milk protein product. Um, are the standard ones used, and again, it's used to soften wines, it's used to stabilize wines, and really round out the mouthfeel of a wine. Um, there are alternatives out there. There are some hybrids. Uh, bentonite is a clay product. 
that's one that we do use for stabilization. So we can use that to heat and cold stabilize a wine, which prevents it from getting that cloudiness if you leave it in your trunk for an extra hour or you stick it in the freezer a little too long. Um, plant proteins, we're seeing um, a lot of research on plant proteins that are replacing gelatins. Uh, you're getting sort of the same effect. Again, like I said, it's a positive molecule, it's a negative molecule. All we gotta do is get them together and it'll help settle out. So plant protein is essentially giving us the same things that we're seeing with gelatins. And then the last one, like I said, winemaking practices. Um, very minimalistic. We want to take a step back, not over-extract the wine, not need a uh, uh, product later on to help um, fix what we, a corrective product that we uh, needed before. So in the vineyard, uh, it starts with early pruning. What we can do is start uh, pruning the vineyard a little bit earlier, that helps the grapes wake up. So grapes go dormant during the winter time and essentially they get on a pretty set schedule and cycle. So the earlier we prune them, the earlier they're gonna wake up. That has uh, a few problems. We have um, uh, problems with frost if they come out a little bit too early, but in hindsight we get a longer extended ripening period without sugar accumulation. So as the grapes ripen, they accumulate sugar as well as the complexity and the flavors that we're looking for. So if we have a longer period, they're gonna slow down the sugars and they're actually gonna ripen and get the complexity that we need without getting the high alcohol or the high tannins that, that we would need to correct later on. Uh, once we get the, the fruit in, we start with hand sorting, which helps get everything out and it makes sure that we have the exact ripeness of the fruit that we have in there. If it's overripe or underripe fruit, we can actually get it out and, and prevent the need as well as um, our pressing and um, our, our actual techniques in the cellar. The lighter the press, the less tannins we actually extract, the less phenolic compounds we extract. So I hope I'm not just blowing all this way over your guys' heads <laughs> by, by big words, but essentially what I'm saying is um, we're not getting too much of a bad thing in the wine that we're gonna need to correct later. We're getting the right amount that we have and we can control that by watching it very closely. Now that we've got the wine in the tank, we've brought it in, uh, we've done our work in the vineyard, we've hand sorted, we've done the light pressing, now is, is when we actually need to start producing the wine. It's in its juice stage. So the lysozyme, which I mentioned at the beginning, is our non-vegan option. It's an egg-based enzyme. What it does is prevent the secondary fermentation. So we don't have to worry about, about uh, getting those creamy, buttery characteristics in the wine if we use it, but we want to figure out how we can get along without using it. So we started doing a few, a few tests ourselves because that was one of the things that was a staple in our cellar. And we learned that it, it doesn't naturally want to happen. So if we monitor it closely, we use the right amount of sulfur, we use the right sulfite level, we can actually prevent it from happening just by monitoring it. Uh, now over to the red wine side of things. Um, the animal products that are, are the standard in the industry, albumin, which is egg whites, uh, gelatins, and casein. And again, one, one theme you'll see that's common here is it's all to soften wine and reduce tannins. So that's one thing we can do in wine production is reduce the amount of tannins that they start with and we don't need to soften it down the road. We don't need to stabilize it down the road. It's already there and it's already ready to go for us. Thank you. So with red wine, again, it starts in the vineyard. Uh, the number one thing is the terroir, knowing your vineyard. So knowing your fruit, knowing when is the right time to harvest, that you reduce the amount of tannins, but you still have the complexity and you still have the ripe fruit that you want. Um, getting in the cell of the fermentation management. So with a red wine production, what we do is we bring in the red grapes, we take the stems off, and everything goes into the tank. Skin, seeds, juice, that's where red wine gets its color from. It gets it from the skin. So a cold soak is we get it in, we get it into the tank, and we let it sit there at a, a very cold temperature, 40 to 50 degrees to actually get the extraction and start getting some of the color that we need. Along with that color come some of the tannins and the phenolic compounds that are gonna be our problems down the road. Um, once the fermentation started, um, there's an extended maceration period, which is essentially post-fermentation, you can leave it on the skins and just let it soak. I always compare it to infusing a vodka with cucumber. You stick your cucumber in there, the longer you leave it, you're gonna have good cucumber flavors. Same thing with that, the longer you leave it, the more color, the more tannins, the more phenolics you're gonna have. So managing extended maceration to, to essentially get the right extraction you want to prevent correction down the road, I think you guys are seeing a theme here, and still get the complexity that you want out of the wine. And uh, we'll get into this uh, in a minute, but um, extraction enzymes and enological tannins, oak alternatives, these are things that are very new in the wine industry, uh, new technology that we can use that can help move things along. 
So these are uh, the new techniques that are out there. The number one uh, that's only been in the industry now for five, 10 years tops is micro oxygenation. Um, as a wine ages, oxygen helps it age, but also oxygen is our enemy. If we have too much oxygen, we can oxidize the wine. So uh, there's a new technique out there that's um, a tiny little stone. It feeds oxygen in at milligrams per liter per month. So we're talking minute amount of oxygen. But we can use this to control the exact amount of oxygen we want. When wine goes into a barrel, it breathes with the atmosphere, the oak interacts, so you get that. With this, in a tank, you can do the exact same thing, but you can manage the exact amount of oxygen that you actually want to get into the wine. At this same time, we can use oak. So we can get oak into the tank with the wine, use microoxygenation, and we can get the right tannin, oak tannin extraction that we really want to get. So again, we're monitoring it very close and we're getting the extraction level that we want to prevent the need to correct the tannins down the road. Uh, next is ultrafiltration cross flow. This is um, not that new in the uh, industry. Reverse osmosis essentially is what it is. It removes tannins and clarifies the wine. So it's a technique we can use to correct problems down the road if we did get a low over extraction or we have too many tannins in there um, to prevent the need to use animal products. And analysis, instrumentation, um, Winemaking has come a long way in the past 50 years as far as analysis and, and chemistry and the techniques behind actually monitoring what's in there. I can now send a sample out to, uh, to a lab and they can tell me the exact amount of tannins I have in there, the exact amount of phenolics I have in there, and I can actually use analytical data to help correct my wine. Um, so kind of tying everything together, it's, it's a big balancing act. So. Um, we want to produce the best wine that we can. We want to get the extraction. We want to get the complexity we can, but we need to make sure that we don't overdo it so we don't need to correct it down the road. So starting in the vineyard, managing the vineyard to prevent overripeness, but still get the complexity. Um, using whole cluster pressing, which uh, I didn't get into too much, but essentially we um, don't just stem our whites. We put the entire thing in the press and that helps a gentler pressing process. So it helps prevent extraction. Uh, decreasing cold soak and maceration, so watching the amount of time we actually leave it on skins and we actually see what kind of extraction we're getting. Uh, Microoxygenation I just talked about and then cross flow and, and tannin usage can, can help, help manage it. Um, so a little bit on the alternatives out there for correcting down the road. Um, same with the whites, um, very, very similar here. Uh, plant proteins and hybrid usage with clay and, and plants can help get the same effect that we're seeing with animal products. Uh, viticultural practices, starting in the vineyard, early pruning, um, ripening periods, winemaking techniques, and then of, of course new technology. And, and one thing that's, that's getting bigger in the industry and we still need a need for, need for is um, research and, and what we can use to prevent malolactic fermentation without using lysozyme, things that we can use besides sulfites, uh, more plant-based products so we're not relying just on certain plant proteins that are out there now, and um, new plant-based products for corrective purposes. There's not much out there right now for over-oxidized wines, wines that went bad. It happens. You gotta fix them at some point. Uh, so again, this kind of ties everything back together that I was saying is, is, is um, there's animal products that are out there in wine and there's things that we can, we can really do to counterbalance them and, and managing the fermentation, managing the aging process and, and really going back to, like I started with, a minimalistic style and taking a step back and really getting back to old world techniques and letting kind of mother nature make your wine and, and using just the grapes to produce the wine like they used to. Yeah. That's, that's a very hot topic right now with the TTB, which is the, the government, the part of the government that monitors alcohol. Um, it says contains sulfites. It has to say contains sulfites, exactly. That's the one thing the United States requires. In the UK and Canada and a few other countries right now, they are requiring that. They are requiring, uh, if you use egg-based products, may contain some eggs, may contain milk, things like that. So there are countries out there that are doing it. We haven't yet, but it's coming. France doesn't do it. No, no, France doesn't do it. But there are there are countries out there. There's um, 
I think some of the wine that we did ship to UK, we had to put a little sticker on there that said, you know, may contain egg products on a wine that we did a few years back. So. Yes. Yes. There were a few ones like like egg whites that have been used for a very long time, but essentially um, old world technique is to be minimalistic, is to take a step back. So really there wasn't much use. There wasn't gelatin and things like that that were really used at lysozyme. Uh, extracting fish bladders, this was not something that, oh sorry, this was not something that was um, that was used in the old world at all. So really taking a step back and letting, in France, 2,000 years ago, there was no cultured yeast either. We use all cultured yeast now. So everything was just get some grapes, throw it in a tank, hope it comes out good. <laughs> it's, it's essentially what it was. That's why you hear, you, you hear French wine is there was good years and there was bad years. And because in bad years, it just didn't work out. They threw the grapes in a tank and it didn't work out that year. It was too cold or it was too hot. Or... So are we looking at the use of animal products more since factory farming came into existence? Or is it even older than that? No, it's definitely older than that, but um, I think it's becoming more prevalent because there's more out there now. There's, um, I, I get these catalogs from our, our lab, lab companies, and there's now hundreds of different kinds of gelatins you can use, and they're refining the different animal products. So there's more options out there. So if you have a specific problem, this specific gelatin is going to help it out, and this specific fish bladder is going to do this specific thing. So I think it's just becoming more refined and more available with all the, the developments of, of the modern technology and science behind winemaking. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask uh, about organic, uh, organic wine. Yeah. It, it seems kind of silly to me to maybe insist as a consumer that my alcohol be organic. Mm -hmm. alcohol, right? um, oh yeah, I guess that's it. So I mean like, what, what is your company's kind of, I mean is your wine organic? Or no. It's not? No. And is that uh, something that you think matters? There's, no, I don't. But there is, there is um, three different avenues in that in that world right now in the wine industry. There's biodynamic, there's organic, and there's sustainable. Sustainable is kind of the new thing in every industry. We are sustainability certified. We were uh, certified in 2010 for the first time by the Wine Institute and the California uh, Wine Growing Alliance. We we're one of the first 17 wineries um, in the state of California to be certified. And when people ask me what's the difference between being sustainable, which is this fancy word, and being biodynamic or organic, organic fo focuses on what goes into your grapes and what goes into your wine. So do you use sulfites, do you use pesticides, do you use lab-made things, essentially? Sustainability, it doesn't monitor the amount of sulfites or the pesticides that you're using, but it does watch them. But the one thing sustainability covers that organic and biodyna biodynamic doesn't is everything else that goes into making wine. It's not just wine. There's people involved. There's an environment involved. So sustainability uh, monitors the amount of electricity you use, the amount of water you use, uh, your contributions to the community, things like that. So that's all measured on a scoring system with the Sustainability uh, Alliance. And you have to score a certain amount to be certified by them. So we've reduced water usage. We've reduced energy usage and different things. So we monitor what's going into our wine. And, and we pay close attention to the pe pesticides we use, but we also watch the energy, the water, different things that also go into making wine. So sustainable um, certification does not necessarily mean vegan? No, no, it's completely separate. Two separate things. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. And then um, I guess I have a question about this wine in particular. Yeah. Uh, so all your wine is vegan now? Now it is, yes. Now it is. Uh, so, so why do we have something called the vegan vine then? It's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's a marketing tool, but it also is out there so people can see that this wine is vegan without having, I, like I was saying, I get calls constantly from people saying, is your Colchance brand vegan? You see this and you don't have to ask the question. And where do you, where do you find this one? Because I've never seen, uh, I mean, I've seen it's, it's very new. It's, it's something we've only been really pushing in the last year or so. Um, so it's not in very many stores. We've got a, a deal with Whole Foods going right now, so it, it's in Whole Foods. Um, but we're pushing it out right now. We're trying to get distributors. We're trying to get it out there because there is the growing demand for vegan wine. And we do have the name trademark, so we are the only ones that can put vegan on a wine label.
So. Can you explain uh, no sulfites detected? Can I explain? Or buy a, a wine that has that on the label. Okay, so um, I actually just, just had a similar question recently at the winery. Um, sulfites are nat naturally in grapes. Yeah. Grapes naturally produce sulfites. So you have to put may contain sulfites on the label, even if you're organic and you're not adding sulfites. But what you can do is you can go through a government agency and you can actually have your, your wines run by an accredited lab to see if you can actually detect sulfites in there. Because they naturally precipitate out during fermentation. So if you're not adding sulfites, really the amount of sulfite in there is undetectable. So that means that they went through the process of saying, hey, there's sulfites naturally in grapes, but you can't detect it. So if you have a sulfite issue, you can drink my wine and you're not going to have an issue. You said you trademarked um, the word vegan for, for wine labels. Don't you think that's kind of counterproductive now another, like at least for like vegan people, now we can't buy another brand that has vegan on it nope. that we can easily recommend? No, no, not at all, because because you can't put it on your name, okay, is what I'm saying. Put a label on it. Yes, you can put on, say, the back label that says this one was produced using no animal products. So but nobody can the call... Is vegan in the brand no, either? No, not in the brand at all. So it's going to be like a vegan sensation. <laughs> you know, they, they can't yeah, exactly. That's yes, yeah. but, but right now it's very hard to do that because the TTB is really easy to work with. Um, it's very hard to put any vegan on there right now. That's why we actually, I'm not sure if, if the new label says, I don't even think ours says does not contain animal products on it because the TTB won't allow you to do that yet. Mm -hmm. So that's why we had to, to get the name and actually call it the vegan vine yeah, because you can, because... <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I have, I have no idea why they, they can't. They people to know that there's potentially animal products in yeah. line. They're slow come around. Definitely. And you said that you don't think that organic really matters, but could it also be used as a marketing tool just the way that vegan is used as a marketing tool? Oh, definitely. I, vegan Dev, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying it from that perspective. I, he, I think he was asking specifically about our wine. Right. So for our wines, I think I can produce a better wine using sulfides and using some pesticides in the vineyard, is it the best way to go for our environment? Things like that. Possibly not. There's, an, there's another argument there. That's from a marketing tool. But from a marketing tool, definitely. I mean, there's plenty, plenty of wineries out there that, that use it, organic works and things like that that, that use it in their, in their label. Are you concerned with removing pesticides down the road, or is that one of your goals? Or yes and no. We've minimized them dramatically, but uh, I mean, I could I could speak from from one side or or, or one side. But as a, as a winemaker that produces wine, and I'm trying to make the highest quality wine I can. I know I can make a higher quality wine managing what's going on in the vineyard using pesticides. What about, Go for it. Oh, I know you have the sustainability label, but mm -hmm. um, where are you with like fair trade and? Yeah, that's that's definitely involved in, in the sustainability. It's it's a 247 point um, inspection and audit that we have to go through, and that's that's actually a big part of it because um, you know now with with barrels coming from France and um, uh, glass coming from China and glass coming from Mexico, and there there's a lot of that that goes into it and monitoring where we're getting our products from. Anybody else? If you go, if you go one more for me, I think there's one more. Uh, so here, here's a few websites for you. That's our uh, parent website there, Clo. Uh, the Vegan Vine has a website. You can buy the wine on there. You can see where we're at on there. I don't know if uh, uh, any of you have heard of this, Barnivore.com. Really cool website. It's just um, alcohol based. So you can go on there and you can see which beer and which wine is vegan. They have a huge list of thousands of different beers and wines that are vegan and ones that aren't vegan. So a really, really cool website to check out um, to see if, if the, beers, the beers and wines you're drinking are vegan. Yeah. A lot of the same is used in beer, yeah. 
Guinness is one of the, the big ones. They use, they use gelatin and they use Isinglass in the finding of their beer. Mm -hmm. Well, and I guess the other question is, uh, is that is this the trend that they're going to be moving towards uh, vegan wine making, or do you not see that yet? No, I definitely see that. I think that's going to be, you know, going forward, there's a lot of people that are now becoming openly vegan with, with all of the, you know, researchers out there for, for vegans that I think a lot of people are going to start accommodating to that, definitely. And, and not to say all wine out there isn't vegan, because a lot of wine out there is vegan. The wines we were producing before we started the vegan vine were vegan. So there's plenty out there. That's why that's a good website, because there's plenty of wines that, that you can see out there that are vegan. Mm -hmm. Is it more expensive for, for you to produce it vegan versus... No, it's cheaper. It's less stuff that goes into the wine. I don't have to go spend a bunch of money on gelatin or Isinglass or expensive things. But you just have to monitor it more closely? There's sure. more work involved? No. No, no not really. So, what's that? <laughs> we can have wine now. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll open up the wines, grab a glass, feel free to try them all. Um, come on up.